4, 8 through 11. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless, uh, worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I have labored over you in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Be to Christ. Thank you. It's good to be here this morning. My name is Russ Ramsey. If we haven't met, I am the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church's Cool Springs location. And uh, good to be with you all this morning. I've been preaching at both. Uh, so I was here for the 830 and then drove over there for our service. And now I'm back here. Glad to be with you. This passage of scripture um, has a really central focus. And that's what my message is going to be on. I'm going to focus on on really kind of one key idea. The sermon title in your bulletin for this sermon is Being Known by God. My, my working title, as I have been putting the sermon together, is How to Turn Christianity into a New Kind of Paganism in Two Easy Steps. So that's, that's where we're going to be going and what we're going to be talking about. Um, but a little just to catch up to where we are in this passage so that we stay in context. Uh, in these verses leading up to today's text, Paul's been talking to Gentile converts to Christianity. And he's been talking to them, if you remember, about their standing before God. In particular, what their standing is before God in relationship to uh, the Jewish believers that they're worshiping with. And the, and, the, and the response that he gives them is incredible news what he says is though they did not come from a Jewish background, they were so loved and so included that they were to God adopted as sons and therefore full heirs to his kingdom. That's who they are. And so in today's verses, he's still talking to them. So this is still Paul talking to these Gentile converts. So he's just finished telling them, you've been adopted as sons and therefore you're full heirs with Christ. And today he, he, he's, he says this. And what he's urging them to do is he's saying, don't return to the weak and worthless principles of the world. And it could seem that him saying that could be him warning them, hey, don't abandon Christianity and go back to the paganism that you came from. But in the context, we see that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this, and this is the point I really want to focus on today. This text is not a warning against abandoning Christianity and returning to their former paganism. What this text is saying is it is a warning against turning Christianity into a new kind of paganism. And that's where it gets really relevant for all of us. Because the way this happens is very much in play in the church in the West. So I have two key points. Uh, and I'm going to tell them to you right now so you know where we're going. The first thing that we're going to talk about is how does one turn Christianity into a new kind of paganism? And two, what does God want instead? And we're going to use... The headings of Worship Connect serve to unpack that a little bit this morning. So first, a story, which also is a little bit of a parable. This is a true story. I, I was not a popular kid in school. Some of you were, but I was not. But I also wasn't one of the unpopular kids in school either. I was just kind of in the middle. And in the economy of middle school, that meant that I was nothing special. I was a B average student, occasionally I'd get an A, occasionally I'd get a C, but I kind of camped out B average. My family didn't have a lot of money, and so when the other kids showed up to school wearing guest jeans with the little triangle on the pocket, I wore Levi's and I wore Lee's. When everybody was buying Air Jordans, I was coming to school and Reebok high tops, which were not bad, and they were also not Jordans. Their parachute pants <laughs> were black, mine were gray, and that's because gray was the color that made it to the clearance rack. 
So this was me. I wasn't an insider. I wasn't technically an outsider. I was just solidly in the middle. I was a middle class, middle school kid with middle of the road grades living in the middle of the Midwest. Somewhere around eighth grade, I decided that I was going to learn to play guitar. And I was as certain as a boy could be that by learning this instrument, I was going to shoot right past the cool kids into a stratosphere of cool few in my town ever achieved. And so my parents bought me a black Westone electric electric guitar with a Floyd Rose floating tremolo system, double locking humbucker bridge at the pickup, big fat sound and two single coils up by the neck, and it was awesome. And I was looking through some old photos and I found a photo of this guitar. There it is. <laughs> Check it out. It's awesome, isn't it? A curious thing happened. And that is, as I began to learn to play that guitar, I fell in love with it. I just fell in love with it. And it, it's, like it, it's like it turned a lock in my heart and something opened that, wasn't, that I didn't know was there. And I would lose myself in hours of joy playing this guitar, walking in little circles in my bedroom as the, the cord would kind of coil up around my legs and I'd just get lost in learning how to imitate my guitar heroes and I totally forgot that I originally wanted the thing as a way to leverage my position in life. And instead I just loved it. I just loved my guitar. And I felt strangely complete when it was just me and my guitar. And I wish I could convey to you the purity of the joy that I felt being alone in my room with that instrument. But I, I, I imagine that you have something like that. I imagine that you have something in your life that was like this, where your love for the thing itself was enough. Well, there weren't a lot of kids in my school who played guitar, but one day this other kid who played guitar, he said, hey, why don't we bring our guitars and amps to school and we'll set up during lunch on the side of the stage and we'll just, we'll just kind of play around. And that sounded fantastic. And so we did just that. And when we set up on the side of the stage there and we started playing around, two things happened. First thing that happened is a crowd gathered, which I don't need to explain that to you. Guitar solos are awesome. We all know that. But the other thing that happened is it became immediately apparent to me and to everyone there that the other kid was a hundred times better than I was. And his guitar and his amp were a hundred times better than mine. And suddenly, I felt small. And I felt invisible and I felt unknown. And I looked down at my guitar and I regarded it as inferior. And I felt that when it was my turn, my playing was only going to confirm that I was, in fact, nothing special. And just like that, I was back where I started. In a moment, without warning, this thing that had been a source of undefiled joy in my life, playing that guitar, became a conduit for feelings of inferiority and even feelings of anger. Believe me when I tell you, those were spiritual feelings. If they were directed in any direction, they were directed at God. The prestige that that guitar could afford me in the eyes of others in that moment just eclipsed the joy that I experienced when my delight was in engaging with the object itself. The thing I once loved and delighted in became a way for me to just get stuff. 
And so I exchanged the love of the thing itself for a desire for that thing to give me a certain kind of value and standing among my peers. And this is a picture of how it is possible to turn Christianity into a new kind of paganism. It's taking a relationship built on the pure joy of being together, a relationship built on being fully known and fully loved, and turning it into something of a transactional nature. I've been using the word paganism, and I, I recognize that this is probably not a word we just use conversationally. And it conjures certain ideas, and maybe one of the things that you've thought is that, I, hey, I thought paganism was like worshiping statues and performing strange ceremonies in exchange for prosperity now and a good outcome in the afterlife, to which I would say, yes, you're, we're all in the same. That's exactly what it is. Which brings me to how do you turn Christianity into a new kind of paganism in two easy steps? The two easy steps are these. Turn God into an impersonal being who exists to give you stuff. Step two, turn your worship into ceremony that is intended to get you stuff. So make God into someone who exists to give you stuff. Make your worship something that is intended to get you stuff. That's how you turn Christianity into paganism. And so Paul is telling the Gentile converts, he's warning them, he's saying, listen, before you knew God, before you knew about him, you served these lifeless gods. You felt enslaved to them. For things like good fortune and fertility, you, you made sacrifices to them, you paid money, and you performed empty rituals to follow gods who never knew your name. But now, you're completely known. You're completely loved by the one true God. You're loved. You've been adopted into his family as full heirs. And he says, look, the temptation you're now facing is to treat that God as though what he wants most from you is to bring your ritualistic ways from your former paganism into your new faith in him. And so Paul says, how can you do that? How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? See, where the Gentile believers are coming from is, is this. The idea of making religion into a transactional relationship was not a foreign concept to them. When it came to worship, it was their native tongue. But here's the reality of living in a broken and fallen world. Turning religion into a transactional relationship where we get stuff, that's everyone's native tongue when it comes to worship. That's our default language. Believers have to learn a new language. We have to understand worship differently than what we're steeping in. We see this at play in the false teachers in the book of Galatians so far. Because what, what have we seen? Let's take inventory. So far, these false teachers have insisted that Gentile converts practice circumcision, keep kosher, remain separate from the Jews. And now Paul is saying that these false teachers are also commanding observance to feasts and holy days. And so really it's just kind of same song, different verse from the circumcision debate. It's just more stuff to do. Now, I have to say parenthetically at this point, it's important to note that keeping Sabbath is not one of the things that falls into empty ritual, ritual of, of observing feasts and holy days. Uh, keeping Sabbath, Sabbath rest, was something that God instituted at creation. It was before the fall. It's commanded in the Ten Commandments. It's vital for our well-being as people made in the image of God. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is empty ritual. And so we look at the list these Gentiles have been given, the things they've been told are needed for faith. Circumcision, classism, diet, feasts, and what do those things all imply? What they imply is that these are for a God who requires such 
from his subjects in order to be pleased. And that is what? Paganism. The God's impersonal. He has no more life or affection than a statue. And what does he want? Ceremony. He makes demands. They satisfy demands. In exchange for what? Well, in exchange for good standing in the eyes of others. In exchange for good fortune. In exchange for a life that's not as hard as the life you're living now. An afterlife. One of the things I've done, and I bring this up because you've probably done it too, is there are certain sins I've avoided on Sundays that I'll commit on other days of the week because Sunday is Sunday. I don't know if any of you do that. But I think, oh, today's church. I'm not going to commit that sin. You know what that is? That's treating God like a worthless idol, right? It's treating God like somebody that just wants me to do certain things at certain times, and in exchange for that, I get something out of the deal. Examine your own life. Ask the question, what do you think God wants from you? That's such a fundamental but loaded, rich question for a person who's interested in the things of Christ to ask. What do you think God wants from you? What do I think God wants from me? Is your faith more than transaction? Or is even your worship, even being here in this room today, not that much different than basically the task of paying for goods and services? Listen, the affluence that we're steeping in as a culture, especially in our part of the city, in our part of our part, our part of the country, here in Nashville, it's it, it, it's a, it's everywhere. And and the ways that we present as such a put together city, it's a city I love, but we are a put together city. And the occasions, every minute of every day to compare ourselves to other and to measure our self-worth, those things just abound. And we are all kidding ourselves if we think that those things don't influence us. It's so easy to twist Christianity into a system over which we can lay the pursuit of personal gain. And when we're doing that, the way we know we're doing that is we primarily see God as someone to get things from. Which then shapes our worship into ceremony to get things. When we find ourselves there, where we are turning Christianity into a new kind of paganism in two easy steps, God is someone to get things from, our worship is ceremony to get things. You know we are? We're the kid on the side of the stage looking at the guitar that he loves so much and looking at it as though it let him down because it didn't give him the respect of others that he wanted so much. How do you know if that's you? You've told God that he's made a mistake. What does God want from us instead? The answer is really in the difference between being known and not being known. In a pagan system, God is unknowable. And because he's unknowable, his worshipers are therefore unknown to him. And so really the only benefit of that system of worship is transaction. That's all that's left. And when that's our system, all we're doing really is we're heaving the carcass of our sacrifice onto the altar of our hope and we're lighting it on fire and we're hoping for prosperity and good health. But in reality, we'd have to say if we were asked that our worship really moves our heart as much as a trip to the DMV. You've been to the DMV, right? This is not Christianity. In Christ... We're known and we're loved. How loved? 
were adopted as full heirs into his eternal kingdom. What does God want from his people? What does God want from us? He wants us. What does God want from you? He wants you. God's call on the lives of his people is to himself. What God wants for us is for our delight to be in him and for that to be enough. Now, I, I'm not a very aggressive person. I'm not a, I don't like to start arguments. I don't, like to, I, don't, I don't like to do that. And so I feel like I've said a lot of strong things in this sermon. I don't know how you're hearing it. But I'll say this, I want to I wanna acknowledge that in talking about trivializing God, I say this in the context of knowing that, that many of us, life is not easy and, and it's not without suffering and pain. And sometimes we are going through seasons even right now of intense, incredible sorrow and suffering and pain. And one of the things that I found is often in those times, those are the folks that are really clear-headed about who God is. It's not transactional. It's a relationship that's based on need and confidence that we're loved. So I, I don't want to be a bull in a china shop and saying hard things, recognizing that some of us are suffering right now. And I'm not saying get over your suffering and just move on. But what I am saying is what God wants from his people is he wants us. And he wants our delight to be in him for that to be enough. It's as Augustine said, you've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And what happens when our hearts find their rest in in him, when our hearts find their rest in being fully known and fully loved and fully accepted by God. Look at what flows from that. What flows from that in the categories of worship, connect, and serve is this, is that we operate from a position of strength knowing that we lack nothing. Even though we still wait. Worship. Our worship becomes a way of cultivating intimacy with God, of drawing near to the heart of the Father who knows us and knows our name and has said, already you are an heir to everything that is mine. Our worship becomes a way of cultivating intimacy. We don't spend time with Jesus in the way that I used to when I was a kid, when I would spend time with my parents as a teenager because what I wanted was gas money. Instead, what we do is we spend time with him because we really do delight in him. He is our true source of delight. He is our hope. He's enough. And this kind of worship, what it does is it turns our hearts outward. Our worship is not marked by us always being in the presence of God, asking him for things for us. And so rather than focusing on all the things that we feel that we lack... We recognize that in the grand scheme of things and in the truth of Scripture, we lack nothing. And so we worship and we pray from that position of strength that I'm never, ever once trying to persuade God to like me. But I'm responding to a love that already exists. In our relationships, from, an operator, from a position of strength, knowing that we lack nothing, when our hearts rest in being fully known, fully loved, and fully accepted, our relationships with other believers can now include things like transparency and vulnerability. We don't look at our brothers and sisters in Christ as people that we need to impress. Instead, we look at them as people to serve, and to walk through life with, and to be helped by. And because I don't need to impress anyone, just as I'm known and loved by Christ, I can seek to be known and loved by other people and I can seek to know and love them. Instead of seeing others as burdens, we can echo what King David said in Psalm 16.3 and this is what he said of his friends. He said, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones. My translation, my paraphrase of that is this is... This is what comes out of your mouth when somebody walks in the room. You've had this experience. Somebody walks in the room and you see them and you think, I love that guy. 
You have people in your life like that, they walk in your room and your heart just swells with, I can't believe they're here, or it's so good to see you, right? It'll happen a dozen times today in this room. That's what David is saying about his friends. He says, as for my friends, the saints in the land, they're excellent. I love them. They're great. It's not a transaction. It's a moment of, it's a, it's a, it's a relationship marked by delight. Our service to others, when our hearts rest in being fully known and fully loved and fully accepted by God and we're operating from this position of strength knowing that we lack nothing, we serve from a position of strength and provision. We can look at our work not as a means to make and to mark and to prove our worth, but as a means to serve other people with excellence. If I believe that I have everything that I need already, then I can pour myself out without fear of coming up empty. And so I can delight in serving. You know, one of the weak, the weak and worthless principle of the world, in a nutshell, is this. You have no inherent value. And so your worth is yours to make. And this could not be further from the truth. You have inherent intrinsic value. You're made in the image of God. Fully known, fully loved, fully accepted when our faith is in Christ. In Christ we are fully known, fully loved, fully accepted by God. Freedom and joy are found here. We're set free from transactional relationships, from transactional empty religion. We're set free to delight in the maker and sustainer of the universe who made us in his image and knows our names and has prepared a place for us for all eternity. Knowing we're known by God, knowing that, that's the antidote to treating God like an idol. Knowing that I'm known by God. We're known in such a way that he's called us, his children. And he's called us heirs with Christ to his eternal kingdom. That's true now. And so we lack nothing in eternity. Which means we can be sure that we are completely loved and completely accepted even now. And so my prayer is that we would live out of the joy of this freedom and that we would find in God that he alone is enough. Pray with me. Lord, you give us your word. And in reading a book like Galatians, we are in one sense reading somebody else's mail. We're reading Paul writing to this early church in a very particular historical context where there were false teachers te teaching particular falsehoods and particular struggles going on that Paul is combating and yet at the same time this is your word to us and Lord these false teachings and these temptations to treat you in a transactional way have not gone away in fact in many ways, they've, they've intensified and, and we've invented new ways of being transactional with you. But Lord, I pray that you would, one, remind each of us of something in our life that was distilled down into its basic, pure joy. Where doing the thing or being with the thing alone was enough. And that you would then remind us also how much greater you are than any of those things we would name. <coughs> Lord, we're thankful for your kindness, your mercy, your grace, and the gift of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.